全球反恐二十年，以美国北约为首的全球反恐行动是失败还是告捷？小田走进阿富汗、伊朗、叙利亚、沙特、以色列、伊拉克等多个国家，独家对话反恐前沿阵地。全球反恐二十年，世界安全了吗？大家好，欢迎收看本期《风云对话》，我是付小田。反恐风云仍在继续。在上期节目当中，我们回顾了我与沙特、埃及两国外长的对话，他们从各自视角解剖了恐怖主义的根源以及反恐反暴的核心。其中，发源于沙特的瓦哈比主义以及发源于埃及的穆斯林兄弟会，都是我们的访谈话题。两位资深外交官毫不避讳，在敏感话题上直抒己见。其实说到中东的恐怖主义根源，除了意识形态这样形而上的因素以外，还有一些是现实世界里的沉疴。这期节目当中，我们要谈到的就是一个已经催生出至少六场中东战争的重大命题——巴以冲突。一九四七年，以色列宣布在这块流淌着牛奶与蜂蜜的土地上建国，阿拉伯世界一片错愕与哗然。随后便是一连串的。战争与暴力，为此付出生命的有无辜平民，有年轻士兵，还有显赫一时的军事指挥家、政治家。在暴力的过程里，也有对和平的探索。例如，在上期节目当中，埃及外长提到的1978年埃及与以色列签订的戴维营协议。如果时间快进到2020年，还有在特朗普斡旋下签署的亚伯拉罕协议及新中东和平计划。但是这样的探索是成功还是失败？一份份以和平为名、以和平为祈愿的协议，是否真的带来了和平？今天这期节目当中，我们要看到的是我与以色列外交部和军方发言人的两次采访对话，主题正是战争与和平。After decades of division and conflict, we mark the dawn of a new Middle East. 二零二零年九月十五日，以色列和阿联酋、巴林在美国白宫签署了一项被称为“改变中东格局”的历史性和平协议——亚伯拉罕协议。如今，亚伯拉罕协议已签署一年，随着越来越多的阿拉伯国家与以色列实现和解，并为地区带来了更多的发展机遇时，困扰中东几十年的巴勒斯坦问题依然悬而未决。今年五月爆发的新一轮巴以冲突，就引发了各方的广泛关注。一连串的冲突和混乱，似乎在提醒着人们，悬而未决的巴勒斯坦问题仍然会是影响地区和平的导火索。正值亚伯拉罕协议一周年之际，以色列外交部发起了一场主题为“和平”的全球对话倡议。风云对话主持人付小田作为唯一获邀的华语记者参与其中。We say the Abraham Accord was signed nearly exactly one year ago, and how did it make an impact on the exchanges between Israel and the UAE, Israel and Bahrain, the two countries with which you exchanged ambassadors already? I think that first of all, it made a huge uh, change in the bilateral level, and then we'll talk about it in a second. But it changed the paradigm in, in the Middle East. It created a new reality, a reality where their brave leaders. Lead their countries and their people towards peace. Those leaders chose a better future for their kids, their children, and they chose prosperity and stability to the region. And this is a major change in a region that was known basically for its instability and for its, the challenges. I think it's a starting point or the beginning. Of a change that will affect the entire. So the starting、leaders. point is a bravery of the leaders. You call them the brave leaders. Without a doubt, it it takes a lot of courage. What what kind of risks、that. you will say that you are actually encountering? It, it's not a, a, just a risk. It, for years, talking with Israel was a, seen in our in many Arab countries 
as a, a problem. Even having a relationship was a problem. They changed that. They changed it and they are changing their uh, public opinion uh, with them. The yeah. second part, which is an, an important part, is a bilateral relation. Since we signed the Abraham Accords a year ago, we've signed peace agreements with the UAE, with Bahrain, with Morocco. We are in the process with Sudan as well. We've signed 40 bilateral agreements uh, on trade and tourism and economy and technology and, uh, and science to in, uh, create the infrastructure of the uh, future of our relations between our nations. Next step, especially with the restrictions of COVID, is to allow people to actually visit each other's country. Wow, that's very ambitious. When would you say the other major countries could follow the footsteps of countries like uh, Morocco, uh, Bahrain, and the uh, UAE? Do you see that well, happening think, anytime soon? All, I, there are other countries. Mm -hmm. Israel is in, it has contacts and talks with most of the Arab and Muslim countries in the Middle East on different levels, uh, different locations. Uh, and some of them are actually on their way to make those relations public. I don't think that by mentioning one or the other, it will help the process. Oh, okay. But I do hope ah, that you don't want to jinx soon. it. All right, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Having all this said, we can still it. vivid recall that there has been a military escalation between Israel and Hamas starting late May this year. So as you say that there are already ambassadors of the UAE and Bahrain in Israel. So what were their responses during the crisis at the time? Did they urge you to make a ceasefire while they were physically staying in Israel? Or did they even make any implication that they would evacuate or something if their Palestinian fellow citizens would have to undergo all the missiles from Israel? I think that the uh, conflict, the guardian of the walls that took place in last May was a huge test to the Abraham Accords. It was the first time we have a conflict, a, a military conflict with the terror organization Hamas while we are uh, in peace agreements with the new countries, or the, our new partners and friends. The peace agreement and the peace process survived it. It's not only survived it, it's since the operation enhanced the relations, we signed new agreements, we opened and inaugurated our embassies and consulates. So the, we saw that there was wasn't a direct effect. I think that one of the messages that is very important to know is that those countries understand the threat of extremism and fundamentalistic terrorism represented by the terror organization Hamas. And they understand that there is a need to fight it. They understood also that Israel did not fight the Palestinians. It fought against a terror organization that is actually trying to, or to attacking it by right. thousands Let's of millions. Let's go back to the statements that you recently reiterated, that you say Israel craves for peace with all its neighbors, and the Middle East is your home, and you call on all countries of the region to recognize the fact and begin a dialogue with you. So what do you mean neighbors in a statement? Bordering neighbors? So I think that first of all, the, since the creation of the state of Israel, Israel seeks to achieve peace with all its neighbors. What we are looking for is a way to understand that Israel is part of the Middle East. We should be part of the stability in the Middle East. We should be part of the prosperity in the Middle East. There is a lot of things that Israel could give the Middle East. Security is what we're looking for. I fully understand that. I mean, but your intention to create a you know, healthy relationship with all the countries in the Middle East, then how about the country of Iran? First of all, let's see a change in Iran. While Iran is saying that they want to destroy Israel, I'm not sure we have a way to talk with them. Until the 1979 so sure Islamic with Revolution, them. Israel had relations with Iran. We don't have a conflict with the people of Iran. We do have a conflict with the Ayatollah regime, which uh, uh, promotes terrorism, not only against Israel, against other countries in the region that has an illegal military nuclear program that is bringing instability for each and every place that is uh, touching. And this is the major threat, not 
only to Israel. It's a major threat to the Middle East, to the countries of the Middle East, but to the entire right. so, world. So to sum up, as we speak, you do not have an intention to create, uh, I mean, a healthier relationship with Iran, right? So no, which, uh, actually, we hope that uh, the, the, this is not the time, not with this regime. We are not trying to change the regime. We, which Iran, is uh, self-contrary to, to your statement to, that to you crave the peace with all countries in the region. So it's not really the case when it comes to Iran, right? Iran is no, an exception. Is. Do you have I, other exceptions? I, I will remind you, we'll have peace with each, everyone that wants peace with us. All right. Iran, so there's Iran a clause to your statement. Says, okay. No, no. We'll, Iranian regime says clearly that they want to destroy Israel. I don't think this is a good base for the peace negotiation. I understand. When they right. change their policy to destroy Israel, maybe we'll have a chance to talk to them. Right, because uh, I'm, I'm giving you all the questions based on I mean, uh, all the statements that uh, you recently published. So you ask all countries in the region to acknowledge the fact that Middle East is your home. So just out of curiosity, how would you call the Middle East to the Palestinians? First of all, the fact that the Middle East is our homeland, it is the land of Israel is our homeland, is not a question, it's a fact. My family lived in the land of Israel for the last 500 years. The fact that we've lived here doesn't mean that others haven't lived here, but we are the indigenous people of the Middle East. Mm. The roots of the Jewish people in the Middle East go back to more than 3,000 years ago. And there is, this is our homeland. It doesn't mean that there isn't other people that consider the Middle East their homeland. And we have to find a solution for the conflict. Mm -hmm. The solution cannot be based on terrorism, fundamentalism, and terror attack by, uh, against uh, civilians. The solution should be based on negotiation and peace. Right. I mean, I'm not uh, challenging the statement uh, that uh, Middle East is your home, but my question essentially is, do you also recognize that Middle East is a home to Palestinians and they actually also enjoy all the rights that you claim at this moment? First of all, we never challenge the fact that the, the Middle East is the home of other people. This is not one or the other. Palestinians are uh, saying that the Middle East, we, we are not part of the Middle East, and there are uh, countries that not, don't recognize Israel. This is actually what they're saying, that the Jewish people are not part of the Middle East. What we are saying is that we are. We've been here for over 3,000 years. This, we have our roots here, our history here, our culture was based here. They, that doesn't mean that they don't have history uh, here in the Middle East. And it's not a question of what will be the, a, 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 the challenge of history, but the future.巴以冲突中东乱局的根源性问题之一在过去二十多年里巴以和平进程陷入僵局巴以冲突反复出现今年五月十日深夜巴勒斯坦武装组织哈马斯向耶路撒冷和以色列南部城镇发射上百枚火
I'm sure you are aware that already earlier this year that the International Criminal Court launched an investigation into possible war crimes committed by Israel and Palestinian militants in 2014. But look at the media reports. One can only say that this current clash is potentially going to be bloodier than the previous one. So do you have the slightest sense that what you are doing now might be committing another war crime according to International Criminal Court? <laughs> The Israel Defense Forces has never done anything against international law. We stand fully by all of our actions, which are within international agreements, using lawful weaponry. More than that, the IDF is probably the greatest army in the world that is standing in front of a huge threat where we try to neutralize the threat while minimizing civilian casualties. However, so you mean the International Palestinian Criminal Court, so the investigation launch, absolutely makes no sense? International law has been judged by many different people. There are professors and professionals that have looked very, very carefully at what the IDF is doing and has verified and affirmed time and time again that we are well within the rules of the law. What is clearly against international law is the actions of Hamas, which are very obvious to everyone that is probably watching this. They're shooting rockets at Israel, at Israeli civilian targets, not military targets, how do we know? We've had numerous people that have died from this, both Israelis. What were the casualty net figures people. that you got of the both sides, according to what you know? The casualty? Yes. First of all, let me, if I can just continue with what I was saying. We've had, two, yesterday we had two Thai workers that were killed because this is a random firing of 4,000 rockets all over the Israeli population. That is the first violation. The second violation, as we've seen, when we respond to that rocket fire, the terrorists that fired them are nowhere to be seen. What's left? School children, teachers, mothers and fathers. They are firing their barrage of rockets at the IDF from within civilian areas, which is in contradiction to international law. But according to what we heard, what we gather, that the cash figures are absolutely disproportionate. On the Palestinian side, the casualty number as per now is more than 200. While in the Israel, it's like 11 or 12, right? There's a very clear reason for that. Over the last 10 years, Israel, who cares about its citizens, has invested millions and millions of dollars and manpower and brain power in developing the Iron Dome system to protect our civilians. That is why, if we did, had not done that and we didn't have the Iron Dome, 4,000 rockets would have fallen on our population. It would have created thousands of people That dead. is very good. I'm happy time, for you that you are able to defend the life Hamas of the civilians the of the Israel side. Yes, and, and what did Hamas do on their side? But Hamas, instead of investing that money in hope in schools and universities, they invested most of that money that they received from the international community in developing an underground terrorist bunker. And it's the same exact strategy that we've seen time and time again. The disproportion is proportionate directly so in proportion to what- So among the casualties on the Gaza side, how many would you say are civilians? We estimate that we've killed uh, 160 militants on the guys inside. The civilian casualties are very difficult to estimate because the information is coming from the Gaza Health Ministry. And based on all of the recent conflicts, including 2014, those numbers are skewed. We do know of instances where very sadly Gazan civilians were killed. And again, they were killed because when we attack Hamas infrastructure, even though we send uh, text messages, even though we call them, even though we try to evacuate the building, sometimes by doing what's called a knock on the door, we'll fire an unarmed rocket just at the building to say everybody clear out. It's not always 100%, and it is in Hamas's interest to put civilians near the area. So 
are they you are saying? using their civilians are you as saying human shields. That a warning before the attack justifies or ameliorates the bombing. Then do you believe Hamas ultimatum issued on 10th May could have justified their attacks followed that day? Hamas launched rockets at Israel's capital that were completely unprovoked. Hamas launched 4,000 rockets at the Israeli population. They've killed parents, they've killed children, they've killed a soldier, they've killed Thai workers. One person dying in Israeli soil is too much for us to tolerate that an enemy would attack us. War is a very, very difficult thing. No one, Israel doesn't want to be in a war. Hamas has been planning for this for 10 years, and they knew the day that they entered this, that they had two objectives. One was to fire rockets at Israel, and the other one was to bait us to fire back at their launchers. So, and they've been placing civilians all around that time and time again. And that is what we're facing. But you are operating both defensive and offensive missions. So how many the attacks do you have made in Gaza, against Gaza? We have, we, have, we, have, we have attacked the Hamas infrastructure more than a thousand times. Uh, over the last week, they've shot 4,000 rockets at us. We've hit their Gazan infrastructure. We've hit their underground terror infrastructure. We've hit their launchers, their launcher pads, their manufacturing facilities. And you have to understand what this means. A lot of times, the way that Hamas works is they are storing their rockets, not in silos or even in underground bunkers. They're storing them inside of homes where there are residents. So even last night, the former justice minister of Hamas, we notified him. And then we took out the rockets that were located inside his home in a cupboard. What army in the world would hide their munitions in a home where there are men, women, and children sleeping? And what does the IDF do? We warn them. Hamas doesn't warn them. We warn them. They clear out of the way. We take out the, the rockets one by one. It's extremely painstaking and takes a lot of time. And as you can imagine, when we notify them that we're going to attack the terrorists, flee like the civilians. But that's but, what we're willing to do because of the moral code of the idea. But Gaza is a blockade area. How are they able to get access to so many rockets? Gaza has transportation coming in and out, both humanitarian aid that comes from Israel, electricity, which we, in fact, in Israel, supply the electricity to Gaza. They have also aid coming in from other areas, from Egypt and from other areas. And they've managed, with Iranian influence, to build these rockets, more than 60% of the rockets are homemade from within the Gaza Strip. They put the money, the international aid money, that could have gone to raising an entire generation of Gazans that would be doctors and lawyers and teachers. Instead of giving those kids that opportunity, they've invested that in the terror infrastructure, and that's why they have thousands of rockets. How would you interpret the Hamas or the Palestinians' motives making this move? So you don't see it at all that they were provoked it, for example. No, they were just out of their mind and want to make this violent not, move against the Israelis. Again, if we go back to the last 10 years, what were both sides preparing for? We were building a defensive missile system to protect our country, and they were building an offensive system geared to kill Israeli civilians, just waiting for an exchange. Because defensive Hamas, systems is much more expensive, I would say. <laughs> well, a defensive system is not only more expensive. We wouldn't need a defensive system if Hamas wasn't shooting rockets at us. This is the 20th year of Hamas shooting rockets at the Israeli civilian population. More than 30,000 rockets have fallen on the Israeli civilian population. Thousands and thousands of mortars have fallen on the Israeli population. Trust me, if we didn't need to put all of that money in a missile defense system and we could use that money for other causes, we would love to do so. We have no choice but to defend our citizens.巴勒斯坦的国土分为两块，一块即约旦河西岸，面积稍大，约五千六百五十五平方公里；另一块则是地中海边的加沙地带，面积远小于约旦河西岸，仅为三百六十五平方公里。地理上的分隔逐渐为经济与政治上的分隔埋下伏笔。Well, this currently ongoing exchange of fire, since when did IDF see it coming and started to prepare for the escalation? The IDF has been preparing. We've always, we're always on preparing. We're always on alert. As you know, we're a small country of 9 million people in the Middle East and an area that has 350 million people. 
We're a very small country with, with a very fine and moral military, and we are always prepared for what people send our way because we've been attacked so many times in the last 73 years. But let me put the question another way. It's reported that an arms sale deal with America where $735 million was signed on 5th May. So was that before or after you knew a war with Palestine was imminent? I'm not privy to the details of the arms deal, and uh, so therefore I don't have any information on that regard. I can just tell you that the, based on the way that Israel handles its armed conflicts, we are prepared in advance. I wouldn't try to make any connections or analogies in that respect. We know that we have multiple fronts that are always areas that we have to look after, check after, and the role of the IDF is to keep the 9 million citizens of this country safe. And that's exactly what we're trying but to do as, as while taking out the enemy infrastructure. But as spokesman of IDF, can you confirm that the military aid America provided for Israel was somewhere between three to four billion dollars per year, and Israel spent up to 80 percent of purchasing American weapons? The details of what, what Israel purchases from America are public information. It's not something I, as an IDF spokesman, deal with. I read the same numbers that you do in the newspapers, but I'm not privy exactly to those numbers, so I don't want to present something that could be enough. Have you got any idea that uh, or the size of the uh, foreign aid Hamas receives every year? Yes, Hamas receives, as we know, tens of millions of dollars of foreign aid every year. But nothing we billions. also know that the majority of that foreign aid, hundreds of millions of dollars every year, and the, what, is it, what is sad, what we do know, and again, all these numbers are public information, and we allow the trucks to go into Gaza, that the majority of the foreign aid monies over the last 10 years have been spent on building this underground metro system. If I ask you in China or in Israel, what is a metro system? It's a system that is used to enable civilians to go to work, to go to jobs, to go to schools. This metro system is not for civilians. It's for terrorists who are planning attacks against Israelis. 与斯皮尔曼的采访在巴以交火正酣时进行的，也是以色列军方发言人与华语媒体的唯一一场。战时专访，当时有收看了完整采访的朋友问我，为什么对以色列军方有如此多犀利的追问？是不是我对巴勒斯坦心怀同情？其实，如果在战争中与我对话的是巴勒斯坦的军方代表，我也会以同样的风格、同等的力度进行提问，甚至拷问。我拷问的不是对方这个人，而是战争的合理性及必要性。国际时政记者秉持客观与中立，但是我们反对任何形式的暴力以及所有本可以避免的战争，而这也本是全球携手反恐最朴素的愿望和意义。反恐风云系列节目走进不同国家，聆听不同声音，回顾二十年反恐成败。我们下期见。